Uh, my name is, as you can see up here, is Jeff Kaplan. Uh, I'm the founder and director of a project that's based at uh, a technology center at Harvard called the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. And uh, we, we basically launched a project uh, with a group of experts that we brought together from around the world, which we call the Open ePolicy Group. And who that is, just so you have some idea of where we're coming from, it's uh, 25 people representing 13 different governments from around the world. Um, some industry representation uh, initially by two companies that um, provide us the resources to do the project, which is uh, IBM and Oracle. So they participated as equals to everybody else. Um, and then some international organizations like the European Commission, World Bank, um, Harvard itself, of course. Uh, so what we basically did is brought together 25 people from around the world to uh, think about and put together a framework of best practices on open ICT ecosystems. Uh, and so openness is a big theme as it is for a lot of people here. Um, the project started about uh, 18 months ago and just recently, as in within the last several weeks, we launched um, what we call the roadmap to open for open ICT ecosystems. Uh, unfortunately, it's, I wanted to say it's hot off the presses, but it's not quite hot off the presses. Um, hard copies, the print run's still being done. But it is accessible uh, over the internet, and at the end I'll, uh, I'll put up the, the website where you can, everybody can pull it off. Um, anyway, just to, what I wanted to do is take a few minutes to um, kind of give you an idea of what the roadmap is, what it's supposed to do, um, hit some highlights uh, of the best practices that the group together and we worked on the basis of what we call rough consensus. Um, very few things we had universal consensus over, but near majority. I mean, a majority, super majority. Um, just give you some highlights, and then uh, happy to take whatever questions or talk about whatever everybody here is interested in. Um, first thing is uh, on the, what was the goal of what we were trying to do? Basically, two things. The first and main thing was to, um, we call it changing mental models. Trying to change how people see the issue of openness um, and to see and think about, uh, to see, manage, and sustain openness across their IT landscapes. So uh, as we all know, people tend to work in their own silos. Uh, and it's true even in the open technology space. People work on open standards, I do standards. Someone works on, as a developer, I work on open source solutions. Um, people who work on architectures and focus on service-oriented architectures. Everybody tends to work on their own thing. And what we wanted to do first and foremost was to get people to think about these issues across the whole landscape. So that was our first order of business. The second thing we wanted to do was provide a pragmatic framework. Uh, we wanted to make something that people could actually use. Um, IT managers, decision makers, something they could actually use in their work. And so we, put, we designed this to be a framework of best practices um, of what the group felt and the group's consensus was along with what we might say is mini case studies. We didn't really have the space um, to do full-blown case studies, but to give little um, box case studies of examples of what we're talking about and what other countries, governments, and enterprises have done. So those are the two things we were looking to do. Um, I think maybe just as a start, uh, I just want to say a word about um, what we're really talking about. When we say openness, um, what we're trying to describe is something new something that's new, a new synthesis of, that's come about from connectivity, from access, from collaboration, uh, from transparent processes. Together, I guess the feeling of the group was that when you bring these together, something new is kind of happening. Um, and that's what we call openness. And we look at it in uh, what we have referred to as an ICT ecosystem, information communication technologies. So what's the ecosystem? The ecosystem is everything. It's the whole IT landscape. And you'll see things pop up. It's the policy framework, it's standards, it's processes, business processes, for example. It's um, the different technologies that are always in play, um, you know, your hardware, software. It's all the stakeholders involved. So, you know, that's end users, that's developers, that's vendors, that's governments in many cases. Um, it's procurement practices, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. It's the laws, legal framework, which is often um, is a great shaper of these things. So we say the ICT ecosystem, we're really talking about sort of the whole ball of wax. And that's the sort of level we looked at first. 
And what, what we're basically saying is these things, this thing openness is affecting that. It's affecting, as we all know in this room, you know, it's affecting software, it's affecting standards, and it's affecting transformation in enterprises and government. And it raises a lot of issues. And um, it changes the landscape, as we all know. I mean, that's why I think a lot of people are here, because there's a lot of changes that this is driving. And those are the kinds of things we want to look at. The way we structured the roadmap, and you'll see it if you get a chance to look at it, it's not that long a document, it's basically three pages and it's not all text. Um, we want to make something concise. The way we structured it is fairly simple format, sort of a, a, a what, why, and how. And I'll just sort of give you some highlights on that. But you know, the what is, what are open ITC ecosystems, ICT ecosystems, you know, why, why are enterprises, why are governments considering them? migrating towards more open environments, what's driving this? And then, you know, the all important how. Um, how are they doing it? Uh, and that's where we try and collect the best practices that our 25 members were able to come up with. So again, I'm just going to go through some highlights. As far as um, the what, the place we started was we wanted to have, we wanted to agree on uh, what we would call first principles things that make an IT environment open. Um, and a lot of these will seem kind of obvious to you, but um, the group thought it was important to sort of start with first principles that decision makers and managers essentially could use as a reference. Um, and again, a lot of these will seem kind of um, almost uh, commonsensical. Interoperable, open ICT ecosystems interoperate. Uh, closed systems can as well, as we all know, but by definition we feel an open environment is interoperable. The second thing is, again, and this is um, good business practice for a lot of you, is it's user-centric. It focuses on user needs early, and, and, and in many cases at the beginning stages of planning, strategic planning, or business planning. The third is that it's collaborative. And again, this is something that people who look at open technologies, we, we all, I don't want to say we take it for granted, but it's crucial. It's one of the uh, really fundamental things about what makes something open is it's, it's in, a, in a way it's collaborative. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, the fourth is it's sustainable. And that means sustainability on different levels from organizational sustainability to technology to financial sustainability. It needs to be something that will be able to perpetuate um, in a sustainable way. And the last is it's flexible. Uh, as, we, as, we, as we know, an open environment, um, one of the great benefits it gives people is greater flexibility. You can switch, swap in and swap out components. You have the ability to upgrade as you wish or as your business needs require. Um, that flexibility is a, is a really important driver as well. Uh, just take a second to sort of, this is going to look a little daunting, but you know, it will be quick. Um, there are a lot of benefits that people have found. Um, when they make a shift towards an open environment. And I just want to just touch on a few. Um, the first thing we start with is that openness enables three things. And we sort of looked at benefits in these three categories. Choice and competition as uh, something that openness will increase. Access and control. And these three are sort of drivers for a lot of enterprises and even governments who are making this shift. Uh, we looked at these three things in relation to basically three, three groups, government, end users, and, and a lot of of often they stand in the same shoes, and industry itself as a beneficiary. And I just want to give you a couple highlights. So um, for governments, and this is again true for other end users, you know, the choice and competition with an open ICT environment, you get a much stronger negotiating position, which ends up lowering costs. Um, which is something a lot of people talk about, but uh, it's certainly something that our group put first and foremost. The other thing is it can also lower migration burdens, um, not just the burdens of cost, but other things that tend to be barriers, um, though they're not easy. We're not saying any of this is easy. For end users, um, a couple of things to highlight, for us anyway, um, you end up having better product selection, more choices of products, and a lot of that is because there's um, new innovations that get enabled uh, when you have open standards and open source and, and the access, which comes, we'll, we'll talk about in a second. And I, I just, to, to reiterate, lower costs, as we all know. F but for industry as well, there's benefits and um, 
in our group, the industry representatives uh, were very quick to stress what was good for them about it. And just to pick out one, um, the development of new and niche markets that didn't exist. And uh, you know, in an open ICT ecosystem, the feeling is, sorry, the feeling is that um, there's more room. There's more room to, to create new markets and to get into new markets, uh, niche markets, sorry. In terms of access, you know, the first and foremost thing that uh, people thought was a benefit was the interoperability. It just a, in an open environment, you're better able to get systems to work together. It's easier to architect interoperability. Um, it, that's true for everybody, not just government, but put it here. The other, a couple of other things that access gives, um, almost by definition, transparency of processes, transparency uh, in terms of code, obviously, um, transparency and specifications. Uh, and that enables uh, people to share, um, another big driver for innovation. Um, when you have this kind of access, people can uh, share what they know sh and, and work together and collaborate in new ways. For industry, uh, the access, among other things, lowers barriers to entry. So you can get new market entrants. And I think you know, a lot of the companies that are here today are proof of that. Um, they are new uh, into new business areas. And so that's a big benefit for industry itself. Um, control. It, this is a big driver for a lot of people, as we all know, and particularly for governments. Um, open source is a very political issue a lot of places, um, and even more so out of the US than in. Uh, and so control is a big driver, and it's a big focal point for people. For governments, um, we wanted to highlight sort of more practical issues of control. It puts functionality, it puts upgrades, it puts the ability to scale into your hands in a way that um, a more closed environment you won't have, where you'll be much more dependent on your vendor partner, as we all know, to make those decisions for you. Or you'll at least have to be negotiating along the way much more um, strenuously than in an open environment, where you will get, essentially get to make the decisions first and foremost, and then you have those discussions. Um, control for end users, one thing that we pointed out was control over data, and particularly the future use of data. And uh, I think there was a presentation here by Massachusetts, so we all know as an example um, uh, recent events that are really about this. Uh, you know, open file formats, which is something that our roadmap highlights, and I'll touch on later again. Um, that's really about control. It's about control of your information, um, both today and going forward. And that's, a, that's, a, that's an important benefit. And lastly, in terms of control, even for industry, um, they're not a loser. I mean, it, control does shift to end users in an open environment. There's no doubt about that. But even for industry, um, and for small and niche players in particular, uh, it levels playing fields to a certain extent. And it allows everybody, essentially, to be better able to keep pace with technology developments. Um, when you have access, that's another piece of access, but this is an overlap between access and control. When you have that kind of access, everybody can sort of get their hands on the stuff, whether it's code or specs or supporting materials, the things that they need to keep up with what's going on in, in the technology innovation. In an open environment, you're better able to do that. So the bottom line, the way we sort of describe the three bottom line drivers is efficiency, innovation, and growth. And uh, you know, those are simple buzzwords, but that's really sort of the big, the big ticket benefits that um, at least the members of our group felt were the big drivers behind this. In terms of the how, sort of how to make this shift, uh, we, we sort of looked at three categories. One we called scoping, which is really basically about you know, what you have, what you influence, and what you want. Uh, the second category is policies um, that will drive decision making. And the third is really the sort of process about managing. Um, so we sort of broke our roadmap up into these three pieces with the how. They're not in sequence. It's not you do one, then you do the other. Um, these are all in parallel, and they all affect each other. So setting policies, figuring out your baseline, these affect each other. And management is sort of an overlay in all of this. I mean, good management is essential. And no more so, uh, particularly so in an open environment. 
uh, what we did is within each of these, we looked at uh, best practices and a few things. So under scoping, we focused on four things. Baseline auditing to sort of know where your, your starting point is. Maturity models, and I'll, I'll talk a second about that. Um, we tried to put together a new kind of capability maturity model. Um, let me, I'll pause on that for a minute uh, when I get to the next slide. The third thing is about putting together business cases, which I think probably for everybody in this room is fairly obvious. You probably do it all the time. But the fact is a lot of people don't. A lot of people take very significant procurement decisions and other policy decisions without really going through the process of putting a business case together. Even members of our group, you know, sort of sat around the table and confessed to that. And um, very quickly, I think everybody thought that, that may, a better practice would be to make it standard policy to build a business case for any significant decision. And the last thing in scoping we did in this sort of laying the groundwork was to try and put together some criteria that people could use for selecting particularly early projects, um, whether it be an early migration to um, some open source or whether it be uh, initial efforts to set open standards. Um, we wanted to try and offer a set of criteria that people could use. With regard to the policy making, uh, again, we looked at sort of four baskets of things. There are more. Um, we focused on open standards. And in, in the roadmap, you'll see there's a lot of attention paid to open standards, actually even more than open source. Um, the second thing was a service orientation. And uh, you know, with particular uh, focus on things like service-oriented architectures. And the third is software, and in particular, open source. And the fourth are sort of policies that are pro-innovation um, as well. Under managing, uh, we sort of broke it up into three pieces. Um, managing, monitoring, sustaining. And we, we gave a set of best practices for each. Um, there are more. We just picked out ones that um, the group as together felt were most important. Uh, just to focus in a little bit on what I mentioned is a, a kind of a new tool, uh, what we call an openness maturity model. Um, we basically offered it as a, not as a best practice so much, but as a first effort to create a capability maturity model that will look at openness across the whole ecosystem. Um, there are a lot of maturity models out there, and they're very good, and they do very specific things. And we tried to um, create or offer as a first attempt one that looks across the landscape and helps people sort of know where they are and, and figure out their path forward. And the way we broke it up is, um, and you'll see this as it sort of uh, uh, slides out here. Um, the different levels go from mainly closed, which is where there's very little open technologies in place and processes are not transparent. There's not as much collaborative development that goes on, etc. cetera. Uh, through all the way to at, at the far end, um, what we would say is measured and sustainable. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these, but what we basically did is we looked at 10 criteria. Uh, to, and we recommended that those 10 things be the things that people look at to figure out where they are on that spectrum. And uh, you can see them up here. Maybe that's a little hard to see. Um, use of OPEC technologies, for example. Uh, linkages among different business units or agencies, if it's a government. Uh, the extent to which it's business process led, or at least linked to business processes. Um, what kind of architecture framework, uh, for example, you know, how modular, how component-based is your architecture? Um, how much is interoperability enabled or not? Uh, your acquisition and investment strategies. Uh, there are 10 factors which we have suggested would be useful to look at in figuring out where you are on this spectrum of openness. Uh, I just want to sort of pick on a few um, particular points. Uh, one on open standards and, and two on open source. Within policies, uh, we sort of broke things up into two big areas, open standards and what we call lateral policies. Um, as you can see, and you'll see it when the box fills in, uh, we spent a little bit more time in open standards than others. Uh, basic policies on you know, what open standards are and what um, policy framework would be needed. And then the idea is to allow an interoperability framework to evolve out of that. Um, for a lot of you, this is, uh, again, maybe fairly simple stuff, 
uh, for a lot of people in our group, including a lot of big governments, um, this was a pretty big bite to take. Uh, and we weren't recommending that people start by having a full-blown interoperability framework. That might be pretty high up the learning curve uh, for people, but instead to allow it to evolve. And the second thing to deal with, with regard to open standards, but it applies to open source and other things, is procurement. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the third is open standards development. The actual process, which is often led by a lot of international organizations, but how open standards develop and how, particularly in this case, governments could benefit by getting more involved in that. And this sort of open standards uh, world, th they all interact together. I mean. Um, your policies and your procurement affect each other, and, and that's what the arrows are basically meant to show, that th this is a dynamic situation, and it, people need to think about it in that way. With regard to lateral policies, um, we looked at service orientation, as I mentioned before. We looked at software policies, and again, that particularly relates to open source. And then we looked at, again, as I mentioned, innovation policies. And everything is, as I said, it's dynamic, so they have an impact on each other, and they need to managers and decision makers need to think of it in that way. On policy making, just for a moment on open standards, um, I just, here, I want to focus for a bit on uh, procurement. Uh, if, um, if hardware and software are the bricks of your IT, ICT ecosystem, open standards, in our view, are the mortar. Another metaphor might be they're the threads that hold it all together. And, and so it, it really pays to think about that as a first order of business. Um, and the reason why I want to focus on procurement for a second is because, you know, opening an ICT ecosystem is really about changing people's behavior. And procurement, in a lot of ways, drives behavior, as we all know. So that's why I just want to sort of hone in on that. Um, if you deal with policies on open standards and interoperability as other things without dealing with procurement, it, you're really creating a paper tiger. And the only way to have real impact and to drive these changes is to make sure that procurement policies reflect what you want. So in terms of a few best practices, um, the first one that the group put forward was that procurement and in RFPs and by policy needs to mandate interoperability. That has to be built in right from the start as a requirement. The second thing is that um, I'm sorry, I don't want to block you out. Uh, technology and brand neutrality. Um, again, it may seem like it's kind of obvious, but a lot of RFPs, as we all know, uh, specify brands, they specify proprietary technology. They, they are set in ways that essentially uh, reduce choices rather than expand choices. In fact, I think we were just talking about that before the session started. Um, it happens all the time. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. Uh, a second sort of priority thing that we're recommending is that procurement by policy and practice get rid of technology and brand specifics and try and be more neutral right from the start. Um, you started to see examples of that. We've seen it around the world. Within our group, as I said, we had 13 governments represented. As we did this, the government of Japan was just putting together a new procurement policy going towards brand neutrality. Um, so even though it seems kind of obvious, uh, there's still a lot of places and a lot of people, and probably people in this room, who um, still will be not neutral about that. And they'll have RFPs which are very specific, even to the extent of naming brands. Um, and we're recommending to get away from that, even though it's not always that easy to do. The third thing about procurement, and this may be a little bit less obvious, is uh, factor in community support and maintenance. What, what do we mean here? And I think we all know this. A lot of RFPs, and a lot of procurement, they will be created so that um, some of the criteria will involve basically how large a scale the vendor is. It'll talk about the vendor's business and business um, health, let's call it. And that uh, what we're saying is in an open ICT ecosystem, this, things work a little differently. Um, you, have, you, know, you have networks, you have communities of, of experts, communities of functional communities that have enormous resources, a lot of expertise, a lot of skills, they've spent a lot of time developing things, they should be a factor in procurement decisions. So that would enable perhaps a smaller or a medium-sized vendor to meet the requirements because 
there'll be other resources outside that vendor company which will be able to brought to bear um, after the procurement's been done or as ongoing support and maintenance. And we're just saying that that's something that should be factored in um, among many other things. Uh, lastly, and again, Massachusetts being in the news for this, as the, the group felt fairly strongly that open data and open file formats should start to become required and that it's one way, one important way to break the lock-in that, as we all know, captures a lot of data and information and that um, this needs to be put into procurement practices. On our, uh, the things we had to say about software, um, let me start out by saying that uh, the group did not, man did not support the idea of mandating open source or any other software development model. The idea was to mandate choice. Um, choice and competition are what drive what people really are after, which is better, faster, cheaper solutions, more secure, more stable. Um, so the issue is really choice and competition and not so much the software model itself. However, that doesn't mean that governments or enterprises or end users should be passive about waiting to see if open source develops, waiting to see who comes to their door to, to sort of partner with them. Um, there was a strong feeling in our group that open source does itself uh, drive increased choices, drive competition, and drive innovation, enterprise transformation. So we're not saying that people should be passive about this um, and wait for maybe open source solutions to arrive. Um, that's not going to always work. Even if you have balanced, non-discriminatory policy, software policies in place, that may not give you the, that may not end up giving you new choices. Um, as we all know, a lot of vendors are very, they won't change unless they face the real possibility of losses. Let's be frank about that. And in order to get to that point, um, there was a feeling that uh, a critical mass of open source is probably needed for that. You probably need to have in your environment in your market, in your country, whatever it is you are, you probably need to have a critical mass of open source in order to see these kind of changes. Um, and one of the first places to start, and again, this seems obvious, but a lot of people don't, is to acknowledge how much open source is probably already within your, your system, your environment, your company, your government. Uh, even people in our group from very, very large governments um, expressed how much surprise there was when they finally sort of asked people to fess up and say, how much open source are you using? Um, the answer is there's always some there and probably a lot. Uh, but the first place, one good place to start is just to acknowledge what's there um, as a starting point. The second thing is to, to manage in ways that will bring change and bring more choices and bring the th these things we're talking about. Um, I said there was a critical mass of open source that might be needed to really sort of bring these changes and make them real. Uh, there's probably a tipping point. I don't know what that exact percentage is. No one in our group uh, was ready to sort of say how much open source there is. That's probably going to vary place to place. But the idea is there is some critical mass needed and that has to be managed in ways that make sense and that deal with both open source and proprietary uh, software. Um, what we've tried to do is uh, think of things in terms of a level playing field. So whether it's open source or proprietary software, commercial, non-commercial, the management of them should be dealt with in a much more standardized way, the same way, for example. So if you have evaluation metrics, they should be applied to both proprietary software and open source. You should be using the same metrics to the extent you can. Uh, source management, uh, obviously very important, but it's not only proprietary software or open source, they both need management practices and they both need to be managed. Um, and that's one thing we stressed. And the third thing is, and this more gets to doing things proactively, is um, collaborative research, collaborative R&D, using the open source model of collaboration, and promoting that. I mean, in a lot of ways, that may be one of the more enduring things about open source is not, I mean, the access to code is one thing, but maybe one of the more enduring things will be that it has really powerfully shown.
what collaborative development can do. Um, so that's software. Uh, just to give you a few best practices on management um, that the group came up with. Uh, first of all, good management is active management. Um, open ICT environments uh, are not as much built as they evolve. And they require constant management. And in a lot of ways, it's more of a management challenge in an open environment than a closed one. Because there are more choices. You have more participation by more stakeholders. For example, you know, getting users into these processes much earlier. Um, you've got more technologies in place. The open systems, open ecosystems are heterogeneous. They're always going to be a mix. The group felt strongly that you're never going to have, it's never going to be all open all the time. That's not likely, and it's probably not the, the, the optimum position to be in. Open environments are going to be heterogeneous, and that is going to create lots of management challenges. Because you're always going to have closed and open and commercial and non-commercial, and you're going to have a lot more things in the mix. Um, so it's important to be active and sort of constantly active. Uh, these are just sort of general bullets. Create momentum for change, like some of the things we talked about. Think about um, investment opportunities that will create, for example, more open source if there's very little in your environment. Promote collaboration, something, again, I sort of alluded to with functional communities. I talked about building them into references and procurement. But uh, there's a lot of collaboration happening out there that um, there's real value to connect to, whether you're a government or whether you're an enterprise. And I think we all know this in this room, but again, it was something we wanted to highlight. Promote your collaboration with functional community. There's real value to that. Um, the third thing is uh, balancing central and localized decision making and solutions. What do we mean here? Um, managers have an opportunity to centralize certain functionality. It saves costs. Um, it might you know, eliminate um, duplicitous systems. Uh, there's real efficiencies to be gained by centralizing certain things. For example, like standards, open standards. Uh, that shouldn't be done at the expense of what we'd say is local decision making, uh, whether it be departments or whether it be individual agencies. They are still in the best position to know what their business needs and requirements are. Um, they're often much closer to the users if it's their service provider. So you wouldn't want to eliminate that. What, what an open ICT ecosystem would allow is for people to centralize the things that make sense to centralize, that the business case supports. And to leave in what we'd say is local hands, things that it makes sense um, for you know, an individual department or an agency to remain accountable for. And that you get a flexibility to basically choose. Um, and individual departments and agencies can, can make those decisions at the same time while some things are sort of centralized. And that kind of flexibility is m better able to happen in an open environment. And the last thing on management, and again, you hear this a lot, um, but we also wanted to stress it, was the idea of bringing users into the process early. When we say the process, that means sort of planning, decision making, um, architectural design. The idea is to take more advantage of the ultimate end users for what you're, what you're aiming for. Uh, again, you hear it a lot, but um, I don't think it can be actually overstressed. Uh, and it's very hard to do. It takes time to bring more people into a process. And you know, uh, some people will say, well, it's going to slow down decision making or uh, make it more difficult. Um, both may be true, but uh, that's our feeling that the gains are much, there's much more to be gained than lost from that. And in fact, you're more likely to end up with solutions and services that better uh, provide what you want to provide to people. So that's where we are. Um, as I said and for the beginning, our idea with this is to change people's mental models, how they think about this stuff, to have them think about open across ICT ecosystems. And in the end, you know, the idea is to bring governments and users and industry, um, the three big drivers, as, as I, I mentioned in the Y chart, efficiency, growth, and innovation. And that's sort of the name of the game um, from where we're coming from.